I want to welcome you to worship on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and I bring you greetings from the churches in South Africa. Uh, we had about, about 60 pastors uh, and several spouses who were at the event that, uh, um, that I was uh, speaking at, and, and uh, with, along with my friend Bob Yarborough, and uh, went very well. It just was just very uplifting to be with those pastors, and, and they all come from um, very dif difficult circumstances when we think of, uh, of the way we live, and, and most of them, you know, living in small houses or tin shacks out, you know, but they, they are just on fire for the Lord, and they have thriving churches, and we're there to support those churches, and, and, um, and they, are, they feel so blessed. I get to talk about you guys all the time, and so they know a lot about you, and uh, um, they send their greetings to you, and uh, your, the blessings to the churches here, and, and really appreciate the support. And they, they said, tell your church that we're so glad that they let you come here and, uh, um, and, and be with them. So, so they feel blessed by you and your participation in this ministry. Uh, also, uh, what a, what a uh, surprise and what a blessing it was when I came home, walked into my office after I got home, uh, uh, and there was all the cards from you and the notes from you and the gifts. And just thank you so much for that. Um, what an uplifting thing. I was, I was only half awake, you know, I walk in and, and, and look at that. <laughs> and, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for that, those expressions uh, for, for Pastor Appreciation uh, Sunday. And, and um, I don't know who organized that. Probably, I don't know, it's one of you guys, probably Sue or somebody or June or somebody or Cindy, I don't know who, but thank you to those who, who got that going and for all of you who, who participated in that. And then enjoy just sitting Friday and reading all of the cards and what a blessing it is. And you need to know I appreciate all of you very much as well. We have, uh, Elisa and I just love, love being here, love all of you here at First Lutheran, so thank you for that. A um, uh, number of things I want to lift out. First of all, we have a couple of birthdays, only two birthdays this week, um, and so they must be very special people. Uh, on Wednesday, October 25th, Susan Loritz, and you have a birthday, so... Uh, Happy birthday this coming Wednesday. And then on Friday, October 27th, Donna Monier has a birthday. So uh, happy birthday to Susan and to Donna. What is that? Yeah, Donna just walked in too. So, <laughs> so our two birthday girls, I said one behind the other there. Um, but happy birthday to both of you. And uh, no anniversaries this week. We have a number of folks that we want to uh, lift up in our prayer concerns. Um, those dealing with cancer, we continue to pray for Jeff Jaquis and for Linda Clock. Linda's here too. Good to see you, Linda. Um, for Karen May, Karen's here as well. Uh, Lauren Cook, Sean Lewis, Nancy O'Connor, Trudy Kreiling, Eric Davis, and Gary Shale. And we want to lift all of them up. Also, um, some others that were added to the prayer list last week when I was not here, Scott Balancephan, uh, the brother of Chris, who is dealing with some heart issues, so we want to pray for Scott. Chris Everson, the son of Jackie Pilcher, was on an ac in an accident riding his e-bike and uh, had a severe concussion and was in, in ICU for a few days with that, um, but is home and doing well now, so we, we give thanks to God for that, and we want to pray for Chris again today. Um, Jacob Jaquist was in the hospital while I was gone. He had some health issues as well, and so we want to pray for Jacob. Uh, we continue to pray for Chad Ariel, uh, the son-in-law of Pam and Jerry Zebert, who's been dealing with heart issues. Also, uh, just talking with Nick Smith. Uh, Nick, uh, your wife Sandy fell and broke her elbow this week, and uh, so she's in a cast for that. Um, and so we want to continue to pray for her and, and uh, pray for Sandy and for your daughter Melissa as well with the health issues. And uh, others that we name in our hearts we want to lift up. Um, some other notes. First of all, uh, we will have confirmation class this week, so um, Wednesday night we'll be back in the saddle there with confirmation. However, there will not be Bible study this week on Wednesday morning or Thursday after, or evening. And the reason for that is because um, many months back I agreed to do a, a speaking engagement at, an, at a Lutheran church about an hour from here, talk about the Africa trip. Also, they heard that I had been on Jeopardy, and so they want to know about that, too. So, <laughs> so I don't know which they were more interested in, Africa or, or Jeopardy. But um, 
it's a it's a it's a lunch meeting. It's an and uh, so I have to be there at noon. And so I asked our Wednesday morning group and you know, our Bible study group if they wanted to meet earlier in the morning before I left. And they said, no, why don't we just take another week off? So uh, we're at a good stopping point anyway. We're getting ready to start a new section in First Kings. So um, so we will not meet this week on Wednesday or Thursday, but we'll be back with Bible study the following week. However, I will be back in time Wednesday to do confirmation on the evening, so we will have confirmation. Remember, the Fall into Fun Food and Fellowship event is happening right after worship on November 5th. That's two weeks from today, so put that on your calendar. Also, I have on my notes that uh, there's going to be a 70th birthday party for Mary Lee Twidell on Saturday, November 18th. That's going to be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and they're going to provide lunch with that, so they kind of like to know how many might be coming. Um, they're asking people to uh, RSVP by November 5th, sometime in the next two weeks. And I think there's a sheet in the back where you can sign up to say, yeah, I'm going to be there um, for Mary Lee's party on the 18th. Or you can contact Valerie, and I think her information, is, all the information about that is in the bulletin, if I, I, I'm right. If you, I don't have it in front of me. Um, also, Today is John Baird's final Sunday with us. John, you're moving to Ottawa to be near your brother and sister-in-law there. And so you're moving tomorrow, I understand. Tuesday you're moving. Okay, Tuesday he's moving. And um, uh, in addition to being a, just a faithful attender of worship every Sunday and of our adult Sunday school class, here's some of the things John's been involved in. John has been an usher. He has uh, helped with the food trucks and with old wheels. He has helped Dwayne Smith deliver food from Walmart to the Senior Center uh, twice a week. He has volunteered at the closet for the last 10 years. So you've been very active, John, and uh, God's blessings to you. We're going to have a cake for John downstairs after worship. So uh, come on down and say, say uh, goodbye to John. Uh, yeah? Okay. Oh, it's after Sunday school. I keep forgetting that. We can remember after Sunday school. That's right. November 5th, the, uh, that, uh, that kind of fall fun day that we're going to have, um, there is a sign-up list in the back if you can help out with that in some way. Um, Sue's put that out there. And it is not right after worship, as I said. It's after Sunday school. So we will have Sunday school hour, and then we'll have that, that, uh, that fun day. So if you can help out in any way, check out that list and, and sign up. And then, as I mentioned, also the sign-up for Mary Lee's thing on the 18th is there. So come and join us downstairs after worship. Uh, to say uh, farewell to John Baird. We are ready now to begin our worship. If you'd rise, we're going to please. Be, we're going to begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessing of being your people. You have done so much for us. How, we we can never repay you for what you've done, and so um, we seek simply to live our lives in a way that that um, gives honor to the sacrifice you have made for us in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness. You'll find it on the screen before you. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our, our worship continues with our opening hymn, and I forget what it is. It is number 853, When Morning Gilds the Skies.
continues now on page 138 in the front part of the red hymnal, or you can follow on the screen before you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Our worship is and honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Sovereign God, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our choir anthem. Our anthem this morning is called, This Is My Song. I chose this anthem in September before I knew that it would be the Sunday pastor returned from South Africa or that there would be war in the Middle East. Please listen closely to the words. We in this country often feel like God's blessings shower on us, 
but this brings to our attention that God is the God of all nations, including South Africa, Israel, and Palestine, especially the innocents who are just as hurt by the terrorists as the Israeli people. If you are touched by the words and the music, please end in prayer rather than applause. Thank you.
The first lesson comes from Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsive reading is Psalm 96, verses 1 through 9. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the, the Lord, Lord in the splendor of holiness. holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The second lesson is from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe to one anything except, except owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. For there, so then, let us cast all the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as if in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. gospel is heard according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. Some empty flattery there. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew that they were going to try and trap him here. If he said, yes, we should pay taxes to Caesar, he might lose the support of some of the crowd. If he were to say no, then they could report him to the Romans saying he is, he is uh, a revolutionary. So they're trying to trap him. So Jesus said this in verse 18. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He's pointing out the fact that they were all using the coins that the Romans had minted, the, the coins with Caesar's head on them. And then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. There are things we owe to um, the government and there are things we owe to God. And he says, separate those. And when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated and we invite the children to come forward for our children's time. All right. Come on down. You got, we got a small group today, but we, you guys going to be loud, right? When I say good morning, you're going to say good morning. Ready, Darcy? You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you guys did very well. Yeah. It's good to see all of you guys. Well, you know that I was not here last week. Do you know where I was? Where was I? Where was I? Tuck it. South Africa, that's right. I was in the country of South Africa. And thank you to, to uh, Mrs. Smith for doing our children's time last week and uh, um, sharing with you. Yes, I was in South Africa, and I was meeting with a lot of pastors there, and we were doing some teaching and helping to build up the churches there, strengthen the churches. Did you know there are Christian churches all over the world? And uh, I met with the pastors of about 60 of those churches. It was really, really exciting. Something else happened to me, though, when I was there in South Africa. The place we were staying at, um, right after lunch, we had a little bit of free time, where I, and I went back to my room to rest a little bit. And while I was sitting in my room resting, all of a sudden I heard what sounded like singing. And so I got up and I walked outside my door, and there in the, this, this uh, courtyard, under the branches of a big tree, were about 30 or 40 children. And they were singing. They were having like a day camp there, and they were doing activities, and, and they were singing. They're all under the shade of the tree, and they're singing, and they're dancing, and it was really fun. I just stood there in the doorway and watched them. <laughs> and I thought about you guys. I thought about how um, you know, their skin was black and ours is white, and, and so they had those outward differences, but inside, they were all the same as we are, because inside, they all loved Jesus, and they were singing the praises of Jesus, and it reminded me of when I walked through the hall uh, at the beginning of Sunday school hour, and I hear the singing coming out of the room uh, where you guys are doing your opening before Sunday school, and, and sometimes, you, I don't even know if you see me sometimes, sometimes I stop outside the door and I just listen to you guys for a while because it's such a joy to hear you singing. And so when I saw them singing um, in Africa, I thought of you guys singing the praises of Jesus just like them. And it reminded me, like I said, that we may look different on the outside, but on the inside, we are all people. And not only are we people, but when we believe in Jesus Christ, 
we have something that makes us, that unites us to people around the world who also believe in Jesus. We have that, that, that love of Jesus in our hearts. And so I wanted to tell you that. And also, you know, when I come back to South Africa, I always bring something with me. And so I found these. I thought these were cool. There's all these different animals. Um, and they have a little magnet on the back so you can stick them on somewhere. There's a lion. There's a rhino. Uh, there's a water buffalo there. Yeah. And, I, you know, they have a special zebra in South Africa called the Cape Zebra from that area. And I saw some out in the wild for the first time. I had never seen them before. I saw three of them. And I said, oh, there's some zebras. And the guy that was driving me said, said, oh, yeah, we see those once in a while. And I said, that's the first time I've seen them. And he says, oh, you should have told me. I would have pulled over and you could have. There was a fence along the road, kind of like we have fence along the interstate here. And beyond there, out in the open field, there were three zebras. It was pretty cool. So I, there's some zebras in here and some gazelles. There's all kinds of cool things. So and when you come up to get your treat today, um, take a look through here and, and, and uh, take one of these as well. I'll put those right there. Don't spend too much time checking because then we'll have to wait for you. So <laughs> but pick out a nice one. And if, if, if you want to switch it later, you can talk to me. But let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for the children of South Africa who love Jesus and sing your praises. And thank you so much for these children right here in Princeton, Illinois, who sing your praises as well and love Jesus in their hearts. And know that even though we look different on the outside, we all have the same uh, heart on the inside. And, and, and we, we are united with those around the world who believe in Jesus and who are worshiping him on this Sunday. Thank you so much for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, come on up here. You can get a treat out of the baskets and you can pick out one of those animals. And while you're doing that, we're going to sing two verses of My Jesus, I Love Thee. It's out of the other songbook. Over the last several weeks, I've been preaching on these texts from Romans, and today I'm going to talk about Romans 13, and I want to read one verse for you again, verse 8, where Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I am not a guy who usually cries while watching a movie. Even if I feel like it, I try to hold it in. It's a guy thing. You know? <laughs> but there, is one, there was one scene in a movie that I went to. This movie this is about 25 years ago, and I remember going to see it in the theater, and it really got to me, this scene. The movie was Saving Private Ryan, and you've all seen it probably on video or whatever, but, it, but maybe some of you saw it in the theater. The story of the movie is something like this. One family has four sons serving in the military during World War II. And three of those sons die in battle in the space of just a few days, right around the time of the D-Day invasion. And so the top army brass decides that, that they want to bring the fourth son home so that his family does not lose all of, all of their sons in the war. 
And that fourth son is Private James Ryan. And so a group of eight Army Rangers led by Captain John Miller, who's played by Tom Hanks, is sent out to find Private Ryan's unit, which is up near the front lines, and bring him back safe and alive. And a lot of adventures happen along the way, and in the process of saving Private Ryan, several of the eight men in the unit die, including Captain Miller himself. Hope I didn't just give it away, but... Uh, but Miller's last words to Private Ryan as he dies there, Private Ryan's holding him in his arms, and, and Tom Hanks' his character, Miller, is dying. And he looks up into Private Ryan's face and he says, James, earn this. Earn it. And the movie then goes from there. It jumps to the present day where an old man is standing in front of a grave at a military cemetery in Normandy. And his wife and his children are standing a few feet behind him. The old man is Private Ryan. And the grave is the grave of Captain Miller. And Ryan's wife comes up behind him and puts her hand on his shoulder and he turns to her with tears in his eyes and he says, tell me I've led a good life. And she says, what? And he says, tell me I'm a good man. And she says, you are. And then he turns back to the gravestone and he salutes it. I get choked up just thinking about it. <laughs> Private Ryan stood there remembering the sacrifice that those men had made so that he could come home alive. And he wondered if he had lived a life that was worthy of that sacrifice. Now he knew that he could never really do enough to earn the incredible gift that those men had given to him. But he wondered if his life had done justice to, to what they had done. Now as I think about that scene, um, I wonder if you and I think often enough about the sacrifices that have been made for us. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about the sacrifices of those in the armed forces who gave the best years of their youth and health of their bodies and sometimes their lives to preserve the freedoms we enjoy today. And I'm not just talking about the sacrifices of our parents and our ancestors who prayed and fought and worked so that we could enjoy the fruits of their labors in this most prosperous country in the history of the world. No, when I think about the sacrifices that have been made for us, the first one that comes to my mind is the sacrifice that God made for us. When he entered into this world in the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, and he lived with us, and he worked with us, and then he suffered for us on the cross, and he died for us. Jesus died on the cross in order to take on himself the penalty for our sins. And then he rose again from the grave in order to seal the deal to prove that he is the one who has power over life and death. And he tells us that if we will repent of our sins and put our faith and our trust in him, then we will receive freely the promise of eternal life in heaven after we leave this world. That is the ultimate sacrifice. How often do we stand under the cross and say, if God has done this for me, what do I owe him in return? Keeping in mind the fact that, that there's nothing you and I can do to ever really earn that sacrifice. The question remains, what can I do to show my love and appreciation for the one who has done so much for me? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us an answer to that question in Romans 13. The title of my sermon this morning is A Debt We Can Never Repay. And what I want to lay out for you from the verses of chapter 13 are three ways by which you and I can show the depth of our gratitude to God in the way that we live our everyday lives. And these are three ways that we can say thank you for God, to God for the incredible <laughs> sacrifice that he has made for us. So number one, the first way we show our thankfulness to God is that we can be good citizens of this world, Paul says. It might surprise you that Paul would say this, after all, he was the missionary for a new religion, a religion that did not exactly have the approval of the pagan Roman government of his day. But Paul was saying to the Christian people, it does not matter that the government is not Christian. We still have an obligation to respect the authority structures that are in place. Here's how he says it. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, does this mean that, that, that all Christians should be politically passive? 
never questioning a, a single thing that the government does, never opposing a single law that is passed. That doesn't mean that. What, what Paul is describing here is good government. And by good government, he means government that governs according to the natural laws of right and wrong, which God has established in the universe. And this is something that Martin Luther calls the first use of the law. Here's how Paul describes it. <coughs> For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Paul does not give us the authority to rebel against the government simply because the government is not Christian, or simply because the government has passed a law or enacted a tax that we don't like. Now, I had to learn this lesson the hard way right after Illinois passed that seatbelt law many years ago. <laughs> um, I've never had any problem with laws requiring, you know, putting seatbelts on minors. Um, never had a problem with that. But when they passed a law requiring adults to, to wear seatbelts, it kind of bugged me. I don't know why it did. It just did. I figured we should be allowed to make those decisions for ourselves. So I was a rebel. And four seatbelts later, tickets later, I learned my lesson. <laughs> it is not easy to get four seatbelt tickets in three years. Uh, I think God gave me that string of bad luck to knock a little sense into my stupid head. <laughs> now, there are some very legitimate reasons why a Christian might sometimes oppose or even rebel against the government, but those are much bigger than a seatbelt law. In general, there are two legitimate reasons why a Christian might be called by God to resist the government authorities. One is that we must resist if the government tells us we cannot worship our God. We have a number of stories in both Old and New Testaments where believers had to resist the government for this very reason. In the Old Testament, Daniel was ordered not to pray, and he refused, and was thrown into the lion's den, where God delivered him. Also in the Old Testament, we talked about this story in the summer also, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ordered to worship an idol of the king, and they refused, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and God delivered them as well. In the New Testament, Peter and the apostles were ordered by the religious authorities in Jerusalem, you cannot, you should not, you shall not preach about Jesus Christ. And Peter responded saying, we must obey God rather than men. We must resist if the government tells us we cannot worship our God. Secondly, we must resist if the government is in serious violation of God's word. During World War II, the Nazi government in Germany ordered the roundup of all the Jews in order to take them to the concentration camps where millions of them were eventually slaughtered. And it was against the law to speak out against this policy or to hide Jews so that, that they would not be taken. Many Christians understood very clearly that they could not obey such laws. Many of them, like Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Corey Ten Boom, suffered horribly, even died, because of their opposition to such government immorality. And so we must resist if the government is in serious violation of the word of God. But when the government is simply carrying out its legitimate function, Paul says we are called by God to obey, even if it drives us crazy sometimes. Paul says, pay to all what is owed to them, Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Jesus said the same thing in our gospel. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. If we don't like the way government is run, by all means we can get involved in politics. Lord knows we need more Christians in places of power and influence. But, but do it the right way. Live your life in a way that brings honor to the name of Jesus. One way that we can show our thankfulness to God is to be good citizens of this world. And then a second way, says Paul, is that we can treat other people with love and respect. I can imagine there is nothing that angers God more than to see those who call themselves Christians being mean and nasty to other people. Not only is it just flat out wrong to treat people badly, but when Christians treat people badly, it is a horrible witness for Jesus Christ. I read a story once about a man who was running late for work. It was a beautiful morning and everyone had their car windows down. That man barely noticed the weather. He was just agitated about the heavy traffic. 
And at one point, he was sitting at a red light behind another car, and when the light turned green, the driver of that other car didn't notice it right away. And so this man laid on his horn, he shouted a few obscenities out the window at the other driver, and when that car in front finally started to move, he showed his appreciation by putting his hand out the window and waving just a part of his hand at the man. <laughs> well, he hadn't gone very far, and suddenly he saw flashing lights behind him. And so he pulled over, and a police car pulled up behind him. And the officer approached his car, and the man said, Officer, I don't know why you pulled me over. I didn't do anything wrong. And the officer said, Could I see your license and registration? And the man handed them out the window, and the officer said, Is this your car, sir? And the man said, Of course it's my car. Why would you think it wasn't my car? And the officer said, Well, I saw the way you acted back there at that traffic light, and then I saw the bumper sticker on your car that says, Jesus is Lord, and I figured you had to have stolen this car. <laughs> People, if we're going to carry the name of Jesus into the world, we need to be good witnesses of that name. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We owe other people in this world our love and respect, not necessarily because of how they treat us, but because of how God has treated us. God says, if you love me, if you are truly thankful for what I have done for you, then do this for me. Love your neighbor. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus did not say, do to others whatever they do to you. He said this, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. Think of that the next time you're considering saying or doing something hurtful to another person. God wants us to treat other people with love and respect. And then a third very practical way that Paul says we can show our thankfulness to God is to make good use of the time that he gives us on this earth. Paul reminds us in this text that our time on earth is very short. He says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Paul believed, he believed that the end of the world might be coming very soon, maybe in his own lifetime. And he wanted the Christians of the day to be ready for the return of their Lord. Now, Paul turned out to be wrong about that, about the imminent return of Christ. But the principle that he talks about here is true for Christians at any time in any place. Because whether or not Jesus comes again in our lifetime, we know that any one of us could go to meet our Lord today. Our time on this earth is very short. And we need to be living our lives in such a way that we will not be ashamed of ourselves on the day we are called to stand before our God. Paul says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. All those were things that they saw in the Roman, Greco-Roman culture around them. Paul says, don't live that way. And Paul identifies here the three most common ways that he, in his day, saw people wasting their lives. Drunken partying, an obsession with sex, nasty attitude. I think I just described about every reality show on TV right now. But anyway. Um, but think about it. Think about all the people in this world who are throwing away the precious little time that they have in this world by getting wasted or by sleeping around or by being in constant conflict with other people. You know, these things are things that, that destroy life and destroy relationships. And uh, I remember once uh, counseling this couple in, in marriage counseling, and uh, we were kind of on surface stuff. And finally, I said to um, the wife, I said, she looked distressed, and I said, is, is there one thing that you can name that you think is, is at the heart of your marital problems? And she said, yeah, it's my husband's pornography collection. Turns out he had hundreds, this is in the days of videotapes, he had hundreds of videotapes. And I looked at him and I said, are you willing today to go out and throw all those in a barrel and burn them all? And he looked back at me and said, no. 
those things, I spent thousands of dollars on them. He was not willing to give up that obsession to save his marriage, and it was sad. It was sad. And uh, um, people, God does not want us to waste our lives and destroy our relationships with all of the obsessions of the world. He offers us a better way. Paul says it this way. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You know, several years ago, there was a phrase that became very popular. It was represented by the initials WWJD. You remember that? What would Jesus do? Now, of course, it didn't take long for that phrase to become commercialized, and it was on bracelets and T-shirts and coffee mugs and bumper stickers. And that's unfortunate because the message behind the phrase was a good one. Whenever you are considering a course of action, first ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do if he were in the same situation? Paul is urging us in this text to do something very much like that when he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Urging us to think and speak and act in ways that reflect what Jesus would do in that situation. Paul is saying Jesus would not waste his time on, on all of the immorality that's going on in our culture. And if Jesus wouldn't do that, then neither should we. How do we show our thankfulness to a God who has done so much for us? We owe God a debt we can never repay, not in a million lifetimes. How do we live in response to that grace? Paul says we respond by living the way God wants us to live, by being good citizens of this world, by treating others with love and respect, and by making good use of the time that God has given us, not wasting it on immorality, but putting on Christ and living as Christ would live. It is the least that we can do for the one who gave his life for us, the one we call our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Please rise and we're going to confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and we sing hymn number 800, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. <laughs> 